One of my um, pet hates of this uh, international development world in which we all work is that we have a tremendous tendency to put acronyms on things. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to resist talking about COD, PBR, <laughs> um, uh, P RBF, P for R, P for P. Um, I'm going to try and resist talking about uh, any of those things. Uh, one of the reasons why I hate uh, those kind of acronyms is they start to take all meaning away from the words. Um, and, and I want to talk about results. I'm going to talk about um, results-based aid, which I know is, is something that's of interest for a lot of people. But I want to actually step back a stage and talk about, about how the UK DFID thinks about results in general, and, and then to talk about results-based aid in that context. Um, so, so that's what I'll do. I'll talk about uh, results a bit, uh, some of the examples that we're starting to develop on results-based aid, um, and then end with some final thoughts. So for me, you know, everything we do is about results. I kind of can't quite imagine a world in which we want to spend money without getting results. So when Susan said, but you know, there may be a tension between results and systems, to me, I don't see a tension because if the result you're looking for is a stronger system that can deliver sustainably into the future, okay, that's fine. Um, then to me, that's a result. And I think, you know, so, so that's how Diffid thinks about results. We think about results as being change for people for whom, in whose interests we, we, we work. Um, and there are lots of different ways of capturing that and delivering that, and we need to think about sustainability, we need to think about all sorts of op uh, issues, but fundamentally it's all about results. Um, so what DFID has been doing over the last um, few years is really trying to orient the whole of our effort behind delivering change, delivering impact, <laughs> delivering results. And we've done that in a range of ways throughout the organisation, and these are just some of them. Um, Allocations, we've uh, re-looked completely at the way we've, we've thought about allocating our funds. Some of you may be familiar with the way we did the bilateral aid review on the UK's um, bilateral aid and the way we've thought about the multilateral aid system and, and did, took forward the multilateral aid review. Um, we've completely re-engineered our business processes so that you really cannot spend money in DFID without demonstrating clearly what kind of result you expect, how can you say that that's, how are you going to show that that's what's happened. Um, we built that into the way we take decisions and the way that we subsequently review projects or programs on an annual basis. And this next point around evidence evaluation, I think, is critical. It's critical for coming to the point that says, let's make sure results are, aren't the wrong things. Mm -hmm. How do we know what really works um, to deliver change for people? Um, what's the evidence about what works? What's the evidence about cost effectiveness? Um, what's the, how are we building and supporting that evidence base, both through our, our own evaluation, through supporting others' evaluation, and also through, in a more deeper way, supporting the research base and, and, and funding research that can tell us what works and what doesn't work. It also means that we're looking at very different data from the kind of data we used to look at before. We have a results framework which lays out very clearly um, what the UK is committed to achieve, um, there are some, clearly, there are some areas that are harder to measure, and we're trying to work uh, both ourselves and internationally at getting better at measuring some of those harder to measure areas. Um, we're very concerned that when we think about what needs to be measured, that we build that capacity in, 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 in countries themselves, so that we're not imposing parallel systems. So sort of really thinking about how will, how will everybody have the data that they need to take good decisions, whether it's about domestic resource utilization in countries, or whether it's about aid uh, or South-South cooperation or any kind of uh, cooperation. Um, in the UK, we've increased the level of scrutiny to which we are um, exposed, obviously deliberately by creating the Independent Commission for Aid Impact, but obviously there's a huge, uh, <coughs> there's a huge increased level of scrutiny on the way the UK spends aid. And, then w and, and really those top five things apply to absolutely everything that DFID <coughs> does. But the last thing is also around, so how do we also um, experiment and develop different ways of delivering results, different ways of incentivizing results? And the innovative mechanisms of which results-based aid is one is asking ourselves the question, in terms of the way we work, how we work, if we change things, are we more likely to, uh, to, to get effective results delivery? Uh, and so it's, the, the mechanisms are very much about the how often. So to sort of put that into context, um, traditional input financing is what, what donors uh, like the UK, many others have tended to do. We, we, pay for, uh, we pay for inputs, we pay for them up front often. Um, the sort of sphere at the top, performance-based financing, it could be a whole range of things, paying for performance, it could be a performance tranche in budget support, which may have been related to policy reform or may have been related to um, particular activities or even to, to, to sort of moving across the, the spectrum to outputs. 
um, could be uh, some of the contracting mechanisms that, uh, that, that we and others use. But the space that we're, I suppose, trying to move into and are actively testing is payment by results. So on the two axes of paying up front or paying on delivery and paying at the level of an input or right through to an outcome, uh, this is the sphere that we're interested in, payment by results. So for DFID, uh, and I've, there's an acronym slipped in there, uh, for DFID, um, what do we think of as, as payment by results? Well, for us, there are three defining features. Um, it's payment based on pre-agreed results, um, paying for outcomes, not inputs. And I think also the inclusion of pre-agreed there is really critical, and I'll, I'll come on to talk a bit more about that. Um, giving recipients or implementers uh, complete discretion on how to achieve those results. Uh, so creating space also uh, for innovation and for, for, for freedom to act in ways that uh, seem to those who are delivering on the ground the most effective. And thirdly, having independent verification of results and those results, that independent verification <coughs> being the trigger for disbursement. Um, so those are the three things that, 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 that are uh, defining features for us. This is kind of how the model works. Um, much of it just tells you what, what, what I said in the page before. The sort of additional things that I would draw attention to are um, publicly disseminating contract and, and, and publicly disseminating results. I think transparency as well is a sort of key theme of this. Um, this is about um, really creating a, a, a very different and much more open uh, relationship between, um, between those who are financing and those who are receiving. Um, negotiation of the MOU, that's where this pre-agreed thing comes in, and I think uh, our experience is telling us that that's an absolutely critical part. And down here, inputs, processes, and innovation, this is really the area where there is this free reign to deliver in a particular way. So that's the sort of model in um, abstract. In terms of the way uh, GFID is taking this forward, um, this is a sort of, this is a typology that we're using that we find helpful, um, which really sort of talks about um, to whom are we transferring the risk? So a results-based aid or results-based uh, financing system transfers the risk um, from, from, from the financer or transfers some of the risk from the financer to the implementer. Um, and that, we think, conceptually has some benefits because it also creates this space for innovation, ownership, etc. But it is, it is a mechanism uh, 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 in which we are transferring risk. And for us, results-based aid um, is about transferring risk to partner governments. Results-based financing is about transferring that risk <coughs> to service providers, or often also in the UK context, for those who are familiar with payment by results, transferring it to contractors. And then um, the blue sphere, that, which is the sort of newest area, I think, which is transferring that risk to investors, um, which is this area of impact bonds. And I think we had a session on social impact bonds um, yesterday, so people may have, uh, or social impact investment, but maybe it was covering impact different Impact investment, but not, if you like, with that right. specificity on the okay. instrument. But, yeah. So I think the green sphere is we know quite a lot about. There's a tremendous amount of work that's been going on globally, the global, um, the, the, the global partnership for output-based aid, um, and the World Bank has, uh, you know, build, been building evidence and evaluation <coughs> material on this. Um, there are sort of a, a whole range of, um, of, of things out there being tested by a whole range of countries. Uh, the blue sphere, pretty new, really um, under development, not yet uh, we, even newer. We don't know anything about it at all. And the yellow sphere is, um, is, is, is really still new. And I guess this is where we are trying to test the um, the Centre for Global Development's vision that many of you will be familiar with around results-based aid and cash on delivery. Uh, what we have is two pilots <coughs> that I'll talk to you in some detail about. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we're, that, that, that we're doing in DFID. This is the Ethiopia pilot. This is, a, this is the team uh, in the DFID office in Ethiopia that's, uh, that's working with that. So moving swiftly on, I, mean, I, showed Chris, I showed Chris the picture earlier and he was like, oh, don't show that. <laughs> <coughs> so moving swiftly on to what's really happening in Ethiopia. So the structure that we have in Ethiopia, the, the Ethiopia uh, pilot is all about improving um, completion uh, in low and secondary. And it sets a price which is differentiated according to um, whether it's boys or girls and whether it's emerging or non-emerging region, regions. So it's setting a sort of a set of incentives which place a, place a higher premium on um, achieving <coughs> getting girls through secondary education and getting children in emerging less harder to reach less developed regions um, so tremendous amount of work uh, with the Ethiopian government to negotiate the agreement and the agreement is around um, a price structure which is based on the number of students sitting an exam and the number of students passing an exam 
Um, so there's a baseline data, and then for every additional child above that baseline, uh, DFID is, con is, is, is committed to paying this price, the prices that you, that you see there, um, w which place a higher, uh, higher, higher premium on, as I said, those, those harder to reach groups. Um, the MOU is in operation. It's just coming to the end of the first year. So I think if I say, where are we now? We're, we're now on the independent verification of results. Um, so this is, and after that, we would expect to pay the payment, whatever it is, depending on the, the, the numbers, in January 2013. So this is the first now sort of working example of, um, of results-based aid, um, pretty much as it was conceived um, by the Centre for, 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 for Global Development. The amounts are quite small. There's a maximum of £30 million over three years, so up to £10 million per year. Um, the baseline moves every year, so uh, each year the baseline changes so that the payment is only made for, uh, for the additional children um, which are, are, are passing or sitting grade 10 exams. I think the sort of really interesting things about this, about this pilot are how it's... I mean, there's very, very early days. So as I say, we haven't even made the first payment. The first independent verification of results hasn't <coughs> happened yet. So this is still very much in the first cycle, and it will be very, very interesting to see how this first cycle goes. I think the sorts of questions we'll be interested in understanding, um, very much interested in understanding, how does this feel from the Ethiopian government perspective? Um, <coughs> so that's obviously going to be sort of, you know, uh, there's a how does it feel from the UK perspective, but absolutely how does it feel from the Ethiopian government perspective? Um, how is, has it... Is it, is it, are the results as we expect? Are they not as we expect? Uh, how is the government choosing to use this free reign to spend money on basically anything it wants to spend it on? How has it chosen to use that? What kinds of choices is it making? Is it playing out as we imagine in the vision or is it, is it quite different? So it'll be, it'll be very interesting. So far, what I think we can say is it's set off a really interesting set of conversations about really where is the common ground of what matters to the Ethiopian government, what the UK is interested in financing and supporting, um, how do we measure those things, how do we really understand those goals, and how do we follow through into, in, into measurement. Um, so that's, that's Ethiopia. The next one is Rwanda. And Rwanda is, uh, actually perhaps I just should say on Ethiopia. So the Ethiopian money uh, is in addition to um, our contribution to the Protection of Basic Services grant, which many, many of you may be familiar with already, um, which finances recurrent costs, for example, including teachers' salaries, and also the UK finances, um, I think also with others, a, a quality improvement programme, um, GQIP, which is a, a quality improvement programme the Ethiopian government has. So the results-based aid component is, 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 a, is alongside a range of other support to the education sector. Um, in Rwanda, a quite different sort of setup. So in Rwanda, um, what we have is alongside sector budget support, and as part of an expanded sector budget support for education, we have what we're calling a results compact, which is an additional part uh, which, is, um, which is specifically uh, tied to results and to achievement of results. It's uh, out of, uh, on, on top of a sector budget support of around 40 million pounds over four years, this an additional nine million pounds on top of that sector budget support. So potentially an additional three million pounds per year. Um, and again, it's focusing on lower secondary completion. The key indicator is the number of its students sitting the exam, um, for which there is a, oh sorry, um, I haven't gone to the next slide. The, the, the key indicator is, is this one here, payment um, per additional child. Um, and also the, here the structure again is, is quite different and the Rwandan government was, was very keen that it had this dual structure where there is an incentive and a, and a payment for every additional child on the year baseline, sort of comparing one year to another. But then the second line, additional payments in 2014 and 2015, are a payment comparing back to the 2011 baseline. So sort of two different payment elements. Um, where we are now is basically the MOUs signed earlier this year, and so the government is in this stage of, uh, of doing whatever it thinks it needs to do to deliver those results an independent verification will, will, will take place at the end of that year. Uh, one interesting thing here, I think, is that it's not showing on the slide, but the, the, the Rwandan government chose to include an additional feature, uh, which it believed was, was hugely important, which was competency in English language in teachers. 
So we're working on the, uh, with the government on the baseline now, and there will be, again, a payment at the end of the three years uh, based on improvements in competency of English language in teachers. And that was something which, again, came out of a very long negotiation with the Rwandan government um, around what, 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 what mattered and how to measure it. Um, and that was something that they very much wanted to put into that framework. So I think the first thing to say is this is stuff is all really new, and it's also, we have to accept, very small scale. So we're, we're in this situation where we don't know yet um, whether these kinds of mechanisms are going to change the nature of the donor-recipient relationship, which I think is, is the potential and the interest that everyone has in, 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 in results-based aid, is, 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 is theoretical potential to change the nature of that, that relationship and to develop a relationship which is far more effective. Um, we just don't know yet. I think it's really important that we, um, that we build that evidence base. What DFID is doing is trying these two pilots in results-based aid, alongside lots of other work in other results mechanisms, but trying these two pilots. Both will be independently evaluated, so we've tried to work very hard on, um, on making sure they are evaluable and that we're going to get reasonable evidence out of them. But frankly, I think you know, none of us should be taking decisions on the basis of two pilots. So I suppose one of the questions is, you know, how can we generate a critical mass <coughs> of different ways of doing things that enable us to, to, to learn and to work out what, what is really going to um, help us all get more for uh, our resources? The sorts of, um, so that, so that didn't quite click. Um, what, there's some thoughts that on this slide around kind of how to do evaluation in this, in this context. It's quite challenging. Um, and I think, again, we're developing, developing those methodologies with others now, and, and, it, and that, I hope, will be part of work that others share in. If we just step back and think, what do we, what do we know so far? Well, I think what we know so far is that the process of negotiation is extremely time-consuming. So there is no way that this is a shortcut to reducing transaction costs. You know, it's a lot of upfront investment mm -hmm. um, of uh, country government time, donor time. So, you know, so, that, so this, is, this is not a kind of quick fix to just hand the money over and sign the contract and off you go. Um, that said, I suppose we still believe that there is this potential for transactions cost saving elsewhere in the process. Um, that's one of the things we'll need to test. That process of quite time-consuming negotiation has, I think, though, proved to be extremely valuable. It has created a different conversation between donors and recipients about results, about what matters, about how to measure it, about baselines, about the quality of data. It has shaped and changed that conversation. I think in that there is something very interesting. When we look um, to what we know about results-based mechanisms more broadly in terms <laughs> of where they're being used in other spheres, not particularly in international development, I think we know that some of the sort of classic pitfalls, um, you know, we're going to need to be watching out for them. We know that, um, that when you set up a system like this, people immediately can start to game it. We know that the, that the sort of fiduciary risk can transfer from being uh, a fiduciary risk on, on funds to being a, a results fraud, um, measurement fraud risk. We know that um, sometimes these mechanisms can have unintended consequences. We know that they can result in a kind of real tunnel vision and hitting the target but missing the goal. So that you know, so I think what we know is that there is no, certainly no magic bullet around this, and it, and it's it's going to be as hard to get this right probably as it is to get anything right. So so we shouldn't imagine this is going to be easy, but we do think it's it's starting to show some really interesting features around changing the nature of that relationship, um, and, uh, and and we're very keen to learn more and to see to see what we wh wh where it takes us. Um, if I can just go for final thoughts, so. The results-based aid <coughs> stuff I've been talking about is just one uh, area of work that DF DFID is taking, taking forward about results. My final thoughts, I guess, are you know, that results, no matter how you use the word, results are not enough. Um, we need to, to, to think about value for money because we can't think about results at any cost or, or, or results in a, in a vacuum from the resources which deliver them. Um, and what we're all really interested in is value for money. And none of us, whether it be country government or, uh, or, 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 or financer or international organization, none of us have money that we can afford to waste. So value for money is about getting, um, getting more for our, for our resources, wherever those resources are. 
And some of the things that I think, and I understand perhaps there's been some discussion around data earlier in the, in, in, in the, in the two days, which I think is really important. Um, some of the things that we're trying to do in the UK and that I think we all need to sort of work together internationally to make faster progress on is really delivering a stronger evidence base that tells us what works and what doesn't work, um, building a much stronger suite of metrics across a whole range of sectors that we can use to actually uh, work out um, value for money. We have some quite well-developed um, metrics in the health sector and in the education sector, possibly in the water and sanitation sector, perhaps much less. We need those <coughs> metrics to cover a whole range of uh, levels, um, cost effectiveness, cost efficiency, economy, uh, wherever you are on that spectrum, we need to know more about how to, how to measure value. Um, we need comparable data and standard approaches so that we can actually start to make uh, really interesting comparisons across the piece and use that to generate possibilities for improvement. And certainly, I, I, I know from my organisation perspective, we have all learnt a lot, I think, about managing results and measuring results, but we uh, need to understand cost with the same depth that we understand results. And we need to think about the incentives that, that we all set. And I guess the incentives piece brings us right back to results-based aid because one of the things we're interested in with results-based aid is will that approach give us ultimately better value for money because uh, it frees up you know, the use of the resource far more effectively. Um, you know, so can we change the incentives that we'll, that we'll deliver that? That's the end from me. Thank you very much. <laughs>